Hey, comic lovers, E-Money and the old man back with you again. So you'll notice uh, Thor's not in the middle once again. Well, Thor's fine, in case you're wondering. He's not sick or anything. He is just unavailable right now. Uh, he is still back at Asgard, and hopefully he'll join us again soon. But for right now, uh, he can't be with us. I hope he's getting fed, because y'all witness, I have all ten fingers. Mm -hmm. And when he comes back, I, I plan on keeping all ten fingers. Dang dog. All right, so hopefully he'll be back soon. But today we are talking about the golden age of comic books, what most people consider to be the uh, beginning of comic books, but we proved that not to be true with the Victorian age and the platinum age of comic books last week. But golden age is the dawn of the superhero age for Absolutely. comic books, which, you know, what most people associate comic books with. So we're going to get into that today, so get ready to buy some more bonds and donate all of your comic books to the paper drive. What? Yeah. <laughs> donate your newspapers, not your comic books. If you're going to donate comic books, bring them to E-Money and the Old Man. What's wrong with you? <laughs> this is Back Issues. Crazy person. All right, so before we get started today, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, give us a thumbs up, turn on your notifications, and if you like, leave us a comment. We'd like to know you guys are out there. All right, so we're getting into the Golden Age. Now, how did the Golden Age begin, old man? Well, most people think the Golden Age began with Action Comics number one in 1938. I concur. The first use of the term Golden Age was in an article called Rebirth by a guy named Richard A. Lupoff. The um, article was published in a fan scene called Comic Art in April 1960. The, the writer Lupoff specialized in science fiction and mystery stuff, so right, right up my alley. Um, he wrote a couple dozen novels and a bunch of short stories. He also edited quite a few science fiction anthologies. I've, I've read a few of them. He was considered an expert in H.P. Lovecraft and Edgar Rice Burroughs. Burroughs wrote the Tarzan novels and John Carter, Warlord of Mars. Now, I know the, the movie didn't do very well, John Carter, but trust me, the books were really good. I enjoyed the heck out of them. Most of them directed toward a younger reader, but they, I read them today. But at any rate, Lopov passed away just last year, October of 2020, and anybody is qualified to name an era of comic books, that he's your guy. Okay. So I'm happy with that. Now, my favorite age, of course, is the Silver Age, because that's when I first got serious about collecting comic books. I mean, I remember as a kid having a couple of Golden Age comics, covers were gone, pages missing. Mm. I mean, they were just tore up. But it's kind of how I got started, but didn't get started collecting until well into the Silver Age. You know, I still am fascinated by the Golden Age. Some of that stuff, oh man, it's great. But it's real hard to find Golden Age comic books that are affordable and that are in a decent condition. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, so like you said, the Golden Age was pretty much the beginning of the superhero. National Allied Publications gave us Superman and then Batman. But a company called Fawcett Comics put out a comic that outsold every other title in the early Golden Age. Mm. Captain Marvel, or Shazam if you must, his name was really Captain Marvel. I get upset because Marvel forced them to change character's name to mm -hmm. Shazam. Mm -hmm. Well, he's always going to be Captain Marvel to me. So he outsold Superman and Batman. His comic, Captain Marvel, was selling 1.4 million copies per comic. Mm. That was huge. Um, they did so well that Fawcett, taking advantage of the popularity, they started putting out Wiz Comics, which was one Captain Marvel was in, they started putting it out bi-weekly. Okay. Um, Fawcett also had the rest of the Marvel family. They had Mary Marvel, Captain Marvel Jr., Seems like there were some nephews, nieces, aunts, uncles. I mean, there was a whole clan of them. <laughs> they also had Bullet Man, Spy, Stat, Sna Spy Smasher, 
and Ivis the Invincible, a magician, in their list. So they had a pretty good group of stuff. And National Allied Publications, screw that, we'll call them DC. Okay. Because National Allied Publications, it's too much. Yeah. So DC, they it became becomes DC. DC. So DC had The Flash, who supposedly was the first hero with, first powered hero with only one power. Um, DC also had The Seven Soldiers of Victory, which I'd love to read some of those. And their comic was titled Leading Comics. Sensation Comics had Wonder Woman. More fun comics featured guys like Aquaman, Dr. Fate, Green Arrow, and one of my favorites, The Spectre. Mm -hmm. Even back then, The Spectre was pretty violent. Um, and of course, Superman in action and Batman a detective and then so, to their own titles. It kind of sounds like it was the Wild West of comic books back then where... You know, it's kind of a free for all, and everybody had these uh, publications with uh, different characters before it uh, all kind of, you know, melded together into well, either DC or Marvel. Eventually, let me go on. You'll get, you'll kind of understand that. Fox Feature Syndicate published Mystery Men comics with the Blue Beetle. They also had the Phantom Lady, science comics with a character named Dynamo, and Will Eisner's Wonder Man showed up in Wonder Comics. Now, if the guys who ran Fox Feature Syndicate could go back and change some stuff, they wouldn't. They would have told Will Eisner to take Wonder Man and go away, because DC sued them because they said Wonder Man was a ripoff of Superman, mm. which he probably was. But that is probably the financial reason why Fox Feature Syndicates went south. Mm. They couldn't afford what they lost in the lawsuit. Then there was Quality Comics. They gave us Doll Man, kind of an Adam type character, in Feature Comics. Uncle Sam was in National Comics. Now, Uncle Sam was a hero whose powers grew because of the patriotism of the country, of the United States. The more patriotic people got, the more powerful he became. Mm -hmm. Police Comics had Plastic Man, Another Will Eisner character called The Spirit, the Human Bomb, and Firebrand. Timely Comics, who we now know as Marvel, Marvel Comics, Comics, had Captain America Comics, Marvel Mystery Comics with, Subner with Namer the Submariner, and Human Torch with Toro, mm. which is where Human Torch was a robot. Toro was a human. I, I, I don't know how that worked. Yeah, it predates uh, <clears throat> Fantastic Four and uh, that version of Human Torch. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he was a robot. Okay. All right, so yes, this was the age of the superheroes. It's also the age of the sidekicks. Yeah. Because, as we all know, Batman and Robin, I just mentioned Human Torch with Toro. Mm -hmm. Sandman had Sandy. Bullet Man had Bullet Girl. I think... Uh, the Star Spangled Kid went on to have Stripesy, and everybody seemed to have a sidekick. Now, most of these sidekicks were heroes in their own right. Okay. But there was always the comic relief sidekick. Like, Plastic Man had Woozy Winks. Okay, you're dropping some knowledge on me. The Green Lantern had Dolby Dickles. I mean, just the name sound funny. Mm-hmm. Well... That being said, it wasn't all superheroes in the Golden Age. In December of 1941, right at the beginning of World War II, MLJ magazines found their niche, niche, Nick? Niche. niche found their calling with Pep Comics number 22. And in 1946, they changed their name to reflect this to Archie Comic Publications. Ah. I guess we know who was in... Pep 22. Mm -hmm. Dell Comics published licensed characters like Roy Rogers, Tarzan, Mickey Mouse, and Donald Duck. Carl Barks, the famed writer of Uncle Scrooge and other Disney stuff, became known during the Golden Age. All right. Now, along comes World War II, and it changes the game for pretty much all the comic book publish publishers. When we enter the war, Patriotic fervor became normal. 
Mm -hmm. That's just the way it was. Everybody wanted to read comics of their hero, whoever it might be, kicking Axe's ass. Mm. New heroes like Miss America and the Shield came along, along with a lot of other guys, and they joined the battles against the enemies of freedom. The cover of Captain America Comics number one, always one of my Golden Age favorite shows, Captain America delivering a right cross right to the chin of Adolf Hitler. That was pretty much the sentiment at the time. And these heroes were responsible for selling a lot of the war bonds that were uh, yeah. bought during this time. Absolutely. I mean, their advertisements, uh, Superman and uh, Batman and Robin, and I think even Captain America uh, were featured on uh, vintage, or what are now vintage posters, asking people to donate or for to buy war bonds. Well, hopefully you can find a copy of this, but there's several Golden Age comics where they're actually pitching war bonds on the comics. I remember there was a Captain America issue and a Batman and Robin issue, so hopefully you can find that in okay. show. Alright, so the deal with comic books back then was they were affordable. I mean, you know, five cents, ten cents. Um, so they were portable because let's face it, you could roll them up, put them in your back pocket. Mm -hmm. A lot of kids did. So many a GI could reach back and over in Europe, pull out a comic book, and read about his favorite hero, like mm -hmm. Namor destroying a U-boat, or Captain America wading through a storm of German lead. I mean, we just preached to the times. Mm -hmm. um, the Japanese and Germans and their conniving spies became the villain in most comic books of the day. Mm -hmm. Now. Just to go off on a slight tangent here, uh, despite the uh, comic books being so popular at the time, uh, the war was also a bit of a negative for comic books, uh, looking back on it now, because the war was responsible for destroying a lot of the comic books of the time. Oh yeah, I mean, even I remember long after World War II was over, we still had paper graphs. Oh really? Yeah, okay. I mean, we, we would take all of our newspapers, not my comic books, mm -hmm. But all of our newspapers, and we'd take them off and take them out of the car and throw them I mean, into a big truck. People were being asked to donate everything. You know, people were being asked to donate their paper, their their metal, their rubber. I mean, you see these uh, instructional videos, like people, you know, cleaning out their barns of all their uh, old tools and uh, metal. Ask them to, you know, take it down to, you know, the dry, whatever the dry was uh, for World War II, so that they could remake them into artillery and vehicles and whatever else they needed or for the war effort. Or just save money so they could put more money into the, the war effort. Yeah. So, you know, I, I've talked about this before in, uh, in another episode. You know, when mom starts coming around uh, with a bin looking for Hide your comic books. looking for paper to donate, first thing to go are those silly comic books the kids are reading. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, didn't do uh, comic books long term a lot of favors, the war effort. Not as far as the collectability, no. It, it didn't really hurt the popularity because you got to figure kids donating comic books they've read probably several times. Yeah. I know I should have read mine several times back in the day. Um, but at any rate, these villains of the, of the Germans and the Japanese, they weren't drawn real nice. Mm -mm. They were all drawn subhuman. Mm -hmm. I mean, the caricatures of, of Japanese soldiers was horrific. They mm -hmm. had yellow skin, buck teeth, huge uh, thick eyeglasses. I mean, it was very insulting and would be totally unacceptable to them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the war brought Canada into the comic book business because of the War Exchange Conservation Act, which said that the only thing that could be imported into the Allied countries were things that were necessities. You couldn't import comic books from right across the border to Canada. It was illegal. So a couple of enterprising young guys got together and they started putting out Canadian comic mm. books. Now they were black and white because that's all these guys, these companies could afford. And the comics were called Canadian Whites for obvious reason. Some of the titles included Nelvana of the Northern Lights, Wow Comics and Johnny Can Can Canuck. Canuck. Johnny Canuck. 
Right now, these covenants didn't last long after the war ended because once the United States could import comics again to Canada, the, the flooding of the American comics has pretty much put those guys out of business. Nah. But at any rate, not too long after the war, superheroes dropped out of favor. Mm. Nobody wanted to read the, the, the violent stuff, the, the good versus evil. They just got tired of it, and sales dropped dramatically. And it would be years before the genre returned with a fantastic, amazing ah. vengeance. Wink, wink. <laughs> now, people are probably wondering, or maybe you're not, I don't know. What about Western horror comics? Well, they were late coming to the party. Mm -hmm. um, the first true cover-to-cover -cover horror comic was probably Avon Publications' Eerie in 1946. Not the Eerie that was published by Warren, but Avon Publications. And this was pretty much a one-shot because the title disappeared for years and came back later. But there were six stories in this comic. One was called The Man-Eating Lizards. I always want to say the man eating lizards from Mars or something cool, but no, it's just the man eating lizards. <laughs> oh, okay. It's drawn by young Joe Kubert. Kubert went on to be one of my favorite artists drawing war books in the Atomic Age and even in the Silver Age. And of course, his, his two boys went on to become famous in their own right as comic book artists. But at any rate, we'll pick up on Western horror comics in the next Back Issues History of Comics. The Atomic Age. All right. You should probably have a nuclear explosion. <laughs> anyway, so that's pretty much it for the Golden Age. All right, so we're going to pick this up uh, on the next uh, part of this series, the history of comic books with the Atomic Age. All right, so uh, you know this is usually where we go to the garage, but uh, let's flip it over and start with the Stump the Old Man segment. Oh, boy. All right, so uh, last week I couldn't really do a uh, Platinum Age uh, uh, Stump the Old Man segment because I d didn't know enough about the Platinum Age. And, but, I, and I couldn't answer any of them. So, yeah. Yeah. But this week I do have a Golden Age-themed Stump the Old Man segment. So this could be interesting. All right, so best two out of three. Here we go. Uh, number one. In All-Star Comics number 12, printed in 1942... What job does the Justice Society honor Wonder Woman with? Okay, you did honor in air quotes, so I'm assuming it was not an honor. So, in that day and age, could have made her a cook, could have made her the maid, that would have been an honor. <laughs> I'm going to go with a maid. Uh, incorrect. They make Wonder Woman the team secretary. Oh, yeah, that was an honor. Despite being more powerful than almost every member, Wonder Woman is sidelined with taking notes for the team, and by the end of the issue is named Honorary Secretary while the team sings for She's a Jolly Good Fellow. Can you see them taking Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman and telling her to keep mm -mm. notes? Woo! That was a product of its time. I'll bet you Professor Marston wasn't happy with that. No, I don't think he would have gone for that. No. All right, so over one. On to the next one. According to Forbes Magazine's fictional rich list, what Golden Age comic book character has the biggest fortune? All right, so... Of course, Batman, Bruce Wayne was around the Golden Age, and... They didn't make that big a deal about his fortune. I think Richie Rich was a Golden Age character. Well, the the character is a is Golden Age. They don't make it exclusively Golden Age on the list. Sure, but it's somebody who was around in the Golden Age. Right, right? number one is right. somebody from the Golden Age. Well, I'm going to go with my old pal Uncle Scrooge. Ah. Because he used to swim in it. <laughs> The answer, of course, is... Wow! Scrooge McDuck. Where did you find this at? I haven't seen this in years. I think I dug it out of the garage. Wow. <laughs> that is an uh, original drawing by 
a Louisville artist, Don Rosa, who is probably close second to Carl Barks as the most famous Uncle Scrooge artist ever. I had this done at a small comic book convention that he was set up at, and I had a booth. And I don't remember if you were with me or not. Could have been. I, I went to a lot of, yeah. lot of uh, flea markets and shows at that time. Yeah. So. Well, this was in a, a mall. It was actually in one of the malls, maybe Oxmoor here in Louisville. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've known him for years. Uh, Don Rosa was two years ahead of me in high school. He went. He was in the same class as my sister at, at Atherton High School. But uh, yeah, I've been to his house a couple times. Good guy. All right. Well, Scrooge McDuck tops the list with a personal fortune of $65.4 billion, made mainly from mining and treasure hunting. Uh, Tony Stark comes next, and with his uh, defense contracts earning him an estimated $12.4 billion, followed by Richie Rich, whose vast inheritance brought him a paltry $9.7 billion. Is that all? So, Richie Rich just barely getting by. Mm. So... There you have Scrooge McDuck, the richest man in comic books, yeah, or I'm, duck. I'm glad you found that. That's yep. cool. All right, so that makes you one for two. On to final question number three. This one, probably easy for you. True or false? Beginning with action number one, Superman is featured on the cover of every issue of Action Comics. That's the easiest question you've ever asked me. Absolutely false. Oh. He was on number one. I don't think he showed up again to like number six or seven because they didn't know what they, they had. They didn't know. How yeah. could they have known that? The second one was some newspaper guy. Scoop something. Um, there was a guy that looked like Jungle Jim. There was a big ape stalking behind him. Um, there was some guy that looked like Doc Savage, but it wasn't. He had his shirt all ripped off. I think he had a sword over his head. But, yeah, I mean, they didn't know what they had. They didn't know that they should have put him no. on every cover. I mean, this was the beginning of the superhero age, so uh, other characters, like uh, historical uh, fiction, was uh, still being done a lot during that time, which is what a lot of the covers are. Other characters featured in those early issues was Scoop Scanlan, Super Spy. That was number two, I think. Mm -hmm. And the wizard Zatara, who is the father of Zatanna, which a lot of viewers might know better. He wasn't in the first five, but he was in the first ten, I think. Mm -hmm. So uh, there you have it. So you're two for three. So uh, and once old again, man wins the old man this round. Wins. <laughs> wins. Woo! All right, so that about does it for this episode. But before we go, next week we are continuing our series of the history of comic books. This one with the Atomic Age. Which, I'll be honest with you folks, that was a, a pretty... I mean, the superheroes had died out, like I said. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find a lot of information on the Atomic Age. But I look forward to running at yep. it. I mean, before we started doing this, I thought it just jumped from Golden Age to Silver Age. Well, but most people consider it Golden, Silver, Bronze. I mean, right? But uh, no, we're gonna we're gonna wedge uh, a new one in there. I mean, we didn't do it; somebody else did it. Yeah. But we're gonna, uh, we're gonna mix it up some. Right. So uh, the Atomic Age next week, and that's when we'll see you, kids. Stay tuned for our other videos. We have uh, Wandavision uh, coming out uh, this Friday. As well as, uh, I believe we have our uh, uh, comic book uh, grading for uh, this week's comics. Review. Reviews. So uh, stay tuned for all those videos. So hope to see you guys then. All right. So stay tuned. Excelsior. True believers, if I'm right, this comes out on Wednesday, which is new comic book day at Comic Book World. The old man's got to go get some comics. See ya. <laughs> I want some comments. <laughs>